Welcome. Welcome to our Palm Sunday worship. We're glad that you've joined with us. And these, these next few moments as we gather together, I invite you just to let go of whatever worries, anxieties that you might have brought into this space wherever you are right now. That you might know that God is present with you. That God is with you in these challenging days. And that together we might celebrate this God who loved us so much that he came and lived among us and gave his very life for us. So as Jerry plays, I invite you just to use these moments just simply to let go, to take whatever worries you have, maybe imagine them in your hands and just go like this and say, God, I want to be present with you. I invite you to do that now. Let us come to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, you love us more than we could ever imagine. You love us more than we could ever dream. And so in these moments, as we celebrate that day when you entered Jerusalem, in the final week of your life, in the week that led to the greatest tragedy and the greatest triumph, may we once again become open to how deeply and completely you love us. And as we experience that love, not only may we become more open in our love for you, but we might, might more, become more open in our love for ourselves and for each other, that your love might continue to heal us and transform us, and that we might know that your love walks with us in these challenging days. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Now, it is Palm Sunday, and what would be Palm Sunday about some of those classic Palm Sunday hymns? So I invite you, wherever you are, to join in either singing or listening as we sing together all glory, laud, and honor. And we're grateful to have Jasmine with us today to lead us in that song.
Let us join together in prayer. Ruler of the universe, whose son entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey to the praise of the crowds, help us to recognize in Jesus the one who comes in the name of the Lord and to acclaim him, crying, Hosanna in the highest. May we make sacrifices for the coming of your kingdom, giving not only our hallelujahs, but also our hearts. And may you grant us your grace and forgiveness when we hold those hearts back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to join with me in just a moment of silence. And in these moments, I invite you just to think for a moment, maybe about a Palm Sunday in the past that was particularly joyful, and to rest in that place, and to rest in what it must have been like on that day as Jesus entered Jerusalem for his last week, the week when he would give everything for us. Let us do that now. Imagine you're in that crowd, and as Jesus rides that donkey, he looks right at you, and his eyes are full of love. I invite you to do that now. As we gather in this place, each week we gather at these waters of baptism. Each week we take a few moments to remind ourselves that we have at times succumbed to fear and despair, that we have got caught up in anxiety, that have often led us not to live in love with ourselves, with those around us, with our neighbors, and yes, with God. But in these moments, above all, remember that for every moment when we sense we have fallen short of our expectations and of God's expectations, that we can remember that in these waters we are forgiven. And what better way to remember that on Palm Sunday than with this cross that I hold in my hand? A number of folks in our church have been hard at work all week making these crosses. And in a few moments, we're going to bless those crosses because we're going to be sharing them with the neighbors right around us here at First Presbyterian. Um, and in preparation for that, I wrote a message and. I learned a little bit about palms. I always knew we did it on Palm Sunday. I didn't really know why. And now I know it's because palms have always represented victory. In the Olympic Games, palms were what the victors were given um, when they run their races or their competitions. And so in the midst of the fear and anxiety that can capture us and the stress and strain of these days, we can remember that these palms, this palm cross, signifies that we have victory, that God is with us, and that God remains our refuge and strength, and this God loves each of us no matter what, so much so that he gave his life on a cross for us. So that I can say to you with assurance in Jesus' name, you are forgiven. For God loves each of us, no matter what. Now I invite you to join with me as together we bless these palms that we might share with our neighbors and our friends that God loves them too, no matter what. And each of these palms has a message on it. I'm going to read it for you. 
It says, for thousands of years, people have used palms as a symbol of peace and victory. That's why Jesus' followers waved them on Palm Sunday. May this Christian symbol of the palm be a message of hope that we will overcome these challenging days of COVID-19. Dear God, may this message and these gifts bless our neighbors. May they touch them with your love and your peace. And may they assure them that we will move through this and we will come out on the other side and may be a source of comfort and strength and love. And so, Lord, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And now what better way to celebrate this gift of love and God's gift of love than with song. I invite you once again to hear from Jasmine as she leads us in one of the great songs of Palm Sunday. special treat as Jasmine ushers us into the presence of God as we prepare to hear God's word with that beautiful song, The Holy City.
Wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And as you see, each week we are doing our utmost to provide you opportunities to gather in worship wherever you are so that we might be bound together in one community. I invite you to remember that each week, Monday through Friday, I take a walk along the labyrinth at 12 noon. You can join me live for that, or you can watch it later at your convenience on our Facebook page. In fact, you can find all the information about the church, whatever is happening and going on, we will communicate through the church's Facebook page. So if you're not following there, or you don't like us, then please do that now, and you'll get all the alerts. And speaking of being connected, this week we will continue to provide you the services of Holy Week. And on Holy Thursday, we're actually going to provide you an opportunity to join with us live. We're going to do a brief um, live communion experience. And so what we would like you to do is look on Facebook at 7 p.m. that night. Um, we will be gathering at whatever table you're at. I'll be gathering uh, at my table at home. Uh, with my son Patrick, and you can take uh, whatever uh, juice that you might have, grape juice or wine, whatever fruit of the vine that you would like to share, and a piece of bread, and wherever you are together, we will share in the experience and the sacrament of communion. So you can just click uh, through uh, Facebook or look for emails about that. It will be through something called Zoom. You'll need to download a very simple application for that. We'll be sending you a YouTube video that help you understand more how to do that if you've never done that. So give yourself a few minutes, maybe start preparing around 645 so that you can join with us for our live Holy Thursday. We'll also be doing the Good Friday service, and that will also you'll find on YouTube uh, sometime this week, and we'll let you know when we'll be able to do that and share it with you. And of course, we will share an Easter worship with you as well. So we hope that you will connect and join with us in all those many ways that technology gives us. Now, speaking of technology, 
One of the things that I'm grateful that technology has given me is that I no longer have to look to anyone else for directions. My phone will give me directions. And it's not so much because I don't like asking for directions. I don't mind that so much. What I hated was in the past hearing four awful words that always filled me with stress and anxiety. See, let me explain. Sometimes I would not know where to go, and I would say, I don't know exactly where that is. And then someone who was going as well would say, oh, don't worry about it. And then they would say these four awful words. They would say, you can follow me. And of course, I would agree because I needed to get there. But the whole time I was stressed out, I was thinking, oh my gosh, are, are they going to cruise through a yellow light, leave me stuck at the red, not knowing where I'm going to go? Or are they going to veer across three lanes of traffic to some highway exit and I'll have to risk life and limb to follow them? Now, to be honest, all of those things rarely happened. But they could. And I didn't like being dependent on them to know where I needed to go. I wanted to be in control. I wanted to be in charge. And I thought about that this week because all of a sudden now I'm having to follow all sorts of directions that are kind of complicating my life. They're probably complicating yours. I'm at singing, I sing jingle bells now to make sure that I have washed for the requisite 20 seconds or more. Or I wonder that I count to myself as I put my hand sanitizer on that I've rubbed it in long enough that it's going to take effect. Or now, of course, as I entered the danger zone of the grocery stores, I have to remember not to touch my face. And now I'm going to have to remember not to touch my face, even as I have a mask that I'm wearing. Crazy. And it's so frustrating because I don't like being dictated to. I don't like that this virus is dictating how I live my life. But I do all these things and more. I mean, what can you do? The virus is dictating our life. But still, I want to be in control. I want to be in charge. But the truth is, this whole epidemic situation has just reminded us or told us again of something that has been true all along. And in fact, until you open yourself to this truth, until you accept it, until you even rest in it, you will never become open to the fullness of life that God has for you, to the joy and fulfillment that God yearns to give. Now, what is this truth, this true thing that this epidemic, this virus has shown us? When the words that we are about to hear, Jesus shows us that. So I invite us to join together as together we read this classic text from Matthew 21, as Jesus enters Jerusalem. Listen and hear the word of the Lord. When the disciples had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this. The Lord needs them. And he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, who is this? And the crowds were saying, 
This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, life can seem to feel better when you know that you are in control, when you are in charge. But here's the truth. Even when you think you are in control, you're not really. And only as you realize that, as you accept that, will you find the very life you were seeking. In fact, only as you become willing to let go of this desire for control and become willing to trust will the life you yearn for truly come. I mean, look at this story. These disciples had to let go and trust Jesus in a kind of bizarre way. Put these words in to our context for a minute. You and Jesus and the disciples are going, say, to go to Miami. But you don't have any wheels. So Jesus says, go into Hollywood and right by the McDonald's, you will find a red Honda. And the doors will be unlocked and the keys right in it. Take it and drive it over here. And if anyone asks anything, what well, just say to them, don't worry, the Lord needs it. Does that sound a little crazy? But it works. But you might think, Jesus, you are asking a lot here. I mean, couldn't the disciples have just said, can't we just do it our way? My cousin's buddy has a donkey. We can borrow that donkey rather than Jesus kind of trust these wacky directions of yours. And even if Jesus' directions would work, it might just feel better if you're the one setting the agenda, taking charge, making the decisions. But here's what people don't often see. When you're going through your life, seemingly setting your agenda, taking charge, you're not really. I mean, all sorts of things outside of your control impact your life every day. You don't control the weather. You don't control the traffic. You don't even control your own body. Try stopping your heart or just try to avoid blinking or haven't you already discovered how difficult it is to stop touching your face? Even the things you think you control, you don't really. This past week as I headed into work, I couldn't find uh, the hot cup that I put my tea in. It wasn't in the cup holder in the car, but I thought I brought it. I thought maybe I left it on the kitchen counter. And I'm still not too far down the road, so let me go back and look for it. But the hot cup wasn't, cup wasn't on the kitchen counter. In fact, it wasn't anywhere in the house. I looked all over three times. No cup. And then I thought, oh, I know where it is. I got in the car. I slowly drove along the road. And there my poor cup lay, beaten, yet somehow intact on the side of the road. I had brought the cup to the car. I just hadn't put it in the car. But here's the deal. <laughs> I don't even remember any of that ever happening. I am still amazed that driving along, I didn't even notice the poor thing tumbling off the car. Sheesh. Have you ever had a moment like that? Here's the truth. Our sense of control is kind of an illusion. But still, I mean, even if it is, well, why give up the illusion? But here's what our current circumstances remind us of. Not giving up the illusion can kill you. See, when things started shutting down, you started hearing contrary voices, objections. Is this really necessary? 
People are losing their jobs. The stock market is crashing. Let's get back to work. But then the deaths started piling up. The number of sick grew. The projections of what could be began to become heartbreakingly real. And everyone realized no leader, no nation can set this agenda. No, the virus is doing that. And if we don't accept that, millions could die. So, letting go and trusting scientists, doctors, people like that, that kind of makes sense. I mean, they know, right? But why does it make sense to let go and trust someone like Jesus? to point the way. Someone who doesn't, you can't even see after all. I mean, why did the disciples do it? Well, they realized Jesus' directions didn't need to make sense to them. They simply need to make sense to Jesus. I mean, over the years, they had seen Jesus do lots of things that made no sense to them. Yet when he did those things, amazing things happened. Jesus took five loaves and two fish and fed thousands. Jesus rubbed mud on a blind man's eyes and gave that man back his sight. And so they think if Jesus tells us there is a donkey in the next town with his name on it, we're going to go find it. All we need to know is that he knows more than we do. The trust that Jesus has a plan even if we cannot see it. You know, in these days of COVID-19, as I mentioned during the news of the community, I started a daily practice of walking the labyrinth at noon and broadcasting it on Facebook Live. Now, as I shared on those videos, a labyrinth, it's not a maze. You can't get lost in it. If you follow the path, it will always lead you to the center. But the path will not always make sense. I mean, the path will seem to be leading you away from the center. But if you keep trusting that path, it will get you there. And that's why I walk it. That's why we put the labyrinth there to begin with. Because it reminds us that in our life, God works the same way. That God doesn't always lead us where we expect, but if we trust that path, God will lead us where we need to be. And the labyrinth path has the power to remind you of that. And so that's why I do it each weekday. Not only for those watching, but for me. It reminds me that if I trust the path, that God will bring me, that God will bring you, that God will bring us where we need to be. Even in these uncertain and unpredictable days. And you don't need to know where that will be. You just need to know that God knows. That God will somehow, in some way, get you there. After all, when the disciples took this winding path to the donkey, it probably didn't make sense to them. And then after Jesus' death and his resurrection, they went back and, and, and they looked at the prophecies from the Old Testament that Matthew quotes here, and they realized, ah, that's why he did it. And as they realized that, they realized this, That Jesus was following too. That Jesus was following a path that would lead to his death. And on that path, Jesus 
God in the flesh willingly gave up his power, all his power, even control over his own life. And why did Jesus follow that path? He did it because only letting go like that would bring healing. Only letting go like that would bring wholeness. Only letting go like that would bring joy and peace, not to Jesus, would bring joy and peace to you, to me, to this broken and hurting world. He let go like that because God loves you like that. God loves you so much that God let go of life itself so that you might have life, that you might have life abundant, that you might have life forever. See, for Jesus, after all, letting go did not end in death. That path had a remarkable twist and turn. It ended in life. It ended in a life that even defeated death itself forever. And if God and God's letting go did that for you, you can let go and trust that God's love now and forever. You can let go and trust that God is with you in these days. You can let go and trust that even in these times of fear and uncertainty, that God is still at work. I mean, after all, if God was working in the awfulness of the cross, then God can work anywhere. So yes, wash your hands. Do the social distancing. Control the things you can. And accept the things you can't. And trust that this God who loves you more than you could ever imagine, that this God is still at work. And even when you can't see where that path leads, trust that God is still walking you with you on it. And in that letting go, in that trusting, you will discover more and more the very life, the very peace, the very love that you've always yearned to have. Let us pray. Dear God, we give you thanks that you love us more than we could ever even imagine or comprehend. That you came and lived among us became one of us and gave everything for us. And this week, we remember that great gift of love. And so, dear God, in these moments of challenge, may that love comfort us and give us strength. May it lead us not only to love you, but to be there to love our neighbors and to have that love rest within us. And trusting in that love, Lord, we bring to you all those who are on the front lines of these challenges. We pray for those who are the healers, those who are caring for the sick, the first responders, the folks in health care. We pray that you watch over and protect them as they care for others. And we pray for those who are sick, we pray that they might sense your presence and that they might know your healing mercy. We pray for their loved ones who walk with them even from a distance on that journey. We pray for those who have lost loved ones and we pray your comfort and peace will be with them. And almighty and gracious God, we pray for all those who serve us in the grocery stores and the delivery people all those serving in essential places to care for us. And yes, God, we pray for each other that in these days we might sense your love, your presence, your peace. And we pray it for everyone in this world struggling 
with this pandemic. And for those who are even now searching for a cure. And finally, for our leaders, that you continue to guide them and give them wisdom and guidance that they might be guided to protect and lead us. And Lord, in all these things, we remember that you are the God who is with us always. That you are the God who loves us even as a parent loves her children. And so, dear God, remembering that, we remember this prayer, and as God's beloved children, we pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we gather, please know that we continue to serve you here and that we continue to keep our doors open to be there for you and for this entire community. And in this season of the year, as Easter approaches, we do continue our giving towards others. This year, our Easter offering will go to three things. It will go to the continuing outreach that we're doing, including these palm crosses and some of the things that we're now doing on Facebook and boosting some of those posts to share with our neighbors. In addition, it will go to maintain the ongoing ministries here in the church, and also it will go to support an historic commitment of this congregation to orphans in Haiti, orphans that were battling their own deadly virus, HIV, and now that country faces this virus as well. And as challenging as we find it here, the challenges there will be even more, infinitely more overwhelming. And so we invite you to give generously to our Easter offering. You can Click on the link in the emails we've been sending you. You can go straight to our website, fpcoh.org. You click on the Give button, and under the menu right below it says General Fund, you'll see Easter gifts, and that you can, our Easter campaign. You can click on that, and we invite you to give as generously as you can in these days, that we might be there for our neighbors, our neighbors near, right around the corner, and yes, our neighbors in Haiti. And you can also mail a check always to the church at First Presbyterian, 1530 Hollywood Boulevard. Zip code is 33020. And now with that, let us join in an offering of prayer. Lord Jesus, we greet your coming pilgrim Messiah, servant king, rejected savior, you rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, symbol of humility and lowliness, mocking our dreams of pomp and glory, demonstrating the foolishness of God before the eyes of the world. You have shown us the way of humble service, the way of true greatness. Lord Jesus, help us to follow. In your name we pray. Amen. And now I invite you to join with us in song, either listening or singing wherever you are, as Jasmine leads us in verse 3 of Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Thank you for joining us for this Palm Sunday worship experience. And now I invite you to go out 
As you go out, hear these words of blessing. May this God who has given everything for us extend to you comfort and peace, strength and joy, and an overwhelming sense of God's love that even when you cannot see the path ahead of you, even when we cannot see it, we can know that God walks with us on that path and on that journey in all its twists and turns, and that God, by His grace and by our trust, will lead us to exactly where we need to be. May this God bless you and keep you. May this God's face shine upon you and give you peace. Amen.